The number three, the elusive number in the video game industry, either giving the best in franchises or the biggest letdowns. And some franchises don't even make it to three. Wait, well in the year 1993, after the huge success that was Sonic 2 in the West, and CD also, the highly anticipated Sonic 3 started development in January of 1993 at the good old Sega Technical Institute located in California, still hosting the original Sonic team led by Yuji Naka and Hirokazu Yashuhara. STI was actually split into two teams during the development of Sonic 3, the American team which worked on the highly regarded and critically acclaimed Sonic Spinball, and the Japanese team which worked on the lowly Sonic 3. Development was very rocky for Sonic 3 to say the least. STI director Roger Hector oversaw the development of the game, and with such a strict deadline, it was incredibly challenging to balance the resources for Sonic 3 and other projects like Spinball, along with preventing Sega from harassing the team about updates and making sure the deadline was hit. It wouldn't be a Sonic game if it wasn't rushed. Come on now. The deadline was so strict, the team had to split the wealth of ideas originally planned for the project into two parts. Those being Part 1, Sonic 3, and Part 2, Sonic & Knuckles, which were released in October of 1994, eight months after Sonic 3's release of February 2nd, 1994. This is how it felt being a part of the Sonic 3 development team, according to my inside sources, of course. The game is due in 12 months, lol. Oh fuck, there is a second part due in October. With how crazy of a development this game had, how does it stack up to the other three games of the franchise? And why is it so well revered? Let's find out as we delve into, discuss, and rank. As we stated, development of the third mainline Sonic game went full steam ahead in January of 1993, but not as Sonic 3, actually as a prototype called Sonic 3D, which was built around the new Sega Virtua processor chip that allowed for brand new 3D graphics, but production was halted on this due to the chip not being fully developed until 1994, giving Sonic Team their first major roadblock during the development of Sonic 3 & Knuckles. This 3D prototype was actually salvaged though, becoming Sonic 3D Blast, which released in 1996, two years after the completion of the chip. Upon this realization, Sonic 3 was then rebooted as the more traditional 2D platformer we all know and love. This project was a major undertaking by Sonic Team wanting to make a much deeper and more complex universe, along with tripling the size of the levels in Sonic 2. You can really tell Sonic Team wanted to give this their all. A quote from Takashi Iizuka says it best. We did 1 and 2, but the plan going forward to 3 was that we really wanted to hit a home run. We wanted bigger maps, multiple times larger than Sonic 2, but we also wanted to have more maps. We were having more maps that were also bigger and taking more time to develop. The ideas were so big, it got split into Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles due to a couple reasons actually. Those being, the game was so ambitious due to its large level sizes, level transitions, and music that they actually couldn't fit the game onto one cartridge and bundling that with the tight deadline Sega gave Sonic Team of February 2nd, 1994, they reluctantly split the game into two parts. Azuka explains here the oh shit moment they had when originally working on this. The cartridge sizes were limited in space, so we were finding out that not only did we have these obligations to get the content out at a certain time, but we also couldn't get this massive game that we wanted to make onto the space that the cart would allow. With this in mind, they reached out to the Sega hardware division to create something that could not only stitch together both pieces of this two-part saga, but also make it seamless when playing 3K together. Thus, the lock-on technology was born where locking on Sonic & Knuckles to the original Sonic 3 cartridge gave you the complete 14-zone experience of Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Along with being able to connect the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge onto Sonic 2 to unlock Knuckles as a playable character. I found it interesting that while this all happened early in development, Sonic 3 and Sonic and Knuckles were developed rather concurrently, but the first half was given much, much, much more priority than the second half to meet that sweet Mickey D's deadline. Roger Hector backs us up saying, There were so many creative ideas that it would take too much time to develop such a massive project. The team brainstormed up two games worth of material initially, and it was decided before the alpha stage, I think, that it would make more sense to split it into two games. The claustrophobic deadline made them actually push some things out of Sonic 3. For example, Flying Battery Zone was supposed to be the fifth zone in Sonic 3, but was moved to Sonic & Knuckles making Launch Space Zone the finale. The release of Sonic 3 was huge in the West, February 2nd being named Hedgehog Day, so much so that in Punk Satawani, Pennsylvania, there were mini Sonic balloons, kiosks set up in the local junior high school to play it, and even a Sonic balloon at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. In 
In Japan, on the other hand, Sonic 3 didn't release until May of 1994. While no official reasoning was given, the rumor was that Sega was going to release a 24 megabit version of the cartridge, and then another discovery was found. That being, Sega was not happy with the two-parter model that was released, and was planning on releasing a Sonic 3 Limited Edition, which included both Sonic 3 and Sonic & Knuckles onto one cartridge, but nothing ever came of that. Although Sonic 3 was delayed in Japan, Sonic & Knuckles released globally in October of 1994. I found this interesting because this was the first time Sega catered towards the American audience for Sonic more than the Japanese audience, since Sonic 1. Sonic 2 and Sonic CD all released a few days to a couple months earlier in Japan and Europe compared to America. Sonic 3 and Knuckles in total sold 4 million copies on the Sega Genesis, being the console's 4th highest selling game, only surpassed by Sonic 1, 2, and... Aladdin? This game certainly has some of the most interesting development I've ever seen, and we haven't even gotten to the music, which was a whole nother shit show, but we'll get to that later in the video. Sonic 3 & Knuckles is the pinnacle of 2D Sonic gameplay out of the Genesis era. As we talked about before, the three big pillars that make up 2D Sonic are platforming, physics-based momentum and speed, and the final pillar being exploration. With our lovely diagram here, we have seen games be able to blend speed and exploration-based platforming excellently in Sonic 1, while its sequels focused more on one sole pillar than the other. Those being either exploration or speed-based platforming, which is seen in Sonic CD and 2 that both excelled in their focus. Sonic 3 and Knuckles on the other hand can be placed right in the middle, blending all three pillars better than any game before it and perfecting the 2D Sonic formula. Everything a sequel should set out to do, right? You may ask yourself, well, how does this all blend so well? Let's hop right into it. 3K's gameplay loop is nothing too different from the normal 2D Sonic gameplay, but it refines everything that made the other games so great into one beautiful package. To start, you have three different playable characters in this that also make a natural difficulty curve, starting on the normal mode, being Sonic or Sonic and Tails, as you can play as either, Sonic returns with his normal skill set being the spin dash, and having faster acceleration than the other characters. Instead of the super peel out in this game, he gets another move though, which only shows up in this game to my knowledge surprisingly. That being the W spin attack, which we will call WSA for short. The WSA is an extension of the normal spin attack where if you press jump again while in a ball, a shield will come around Sonic briefly, giving him a few invincibility frames and extending the attack radius of the spin attack. I found this very useful against bosses, especially since some would be out of reach by doing a normal spin attack, but when using the WSA, I was able to hit them and when used at the right time will protect against attacks with those sweet, sweet iframes. I love this ability and wish it would have stayed as a permanent move in his moveset, much like the Super Peel Out, which all feel like natural evolutions to Sonic's toolkit. Similarly to Sonic 2, when you play as Sonic and Tails, Tails doesn't do much but can be used in co-op to carry Sonic to different areas. At least he doesn't get in the way of the special stages in this game. Speaking of Tails, the easy mode of this game, and for the first time ever, has his full own moveset by taking advantage of his flight abilities, letting the player be able to fly short distances while still controlling very similar to Sonic and Acceleration. This is the easy mode because you're able to skip certain sections outright, and his two propellers act as an attack which completely destroys bosses. While Tails goes through the same exact campaign as Sonic, the gameplay is different since there are a lot of high to reach places that only Tails can get to, whether that's a brand new path in these huge sprawling levels, a special stage opening, or some power ups. Tails' gameplay still feels very fresh and is a fun change from Sonic's. And finally, the hard mode, who gets his own separate campaign, Knuckles the Echidna. Speaking of Knuckles, during development, the team wanted to expand Sonic's world even more with a new character, so an internal competition was held for the design of this new character. Takashi Yuda would win this design for Sonic's new friend turned rival in development. Knuckles the Echidna, who was actually green until shown to children who didn't like the green color. From this, the design was changed to red, along with McDonald's, Sega had another deal in the works with Nike, actually, and to appease the great clothing overlords, added a white swoosh to Knuckles' design, which remained even when the deal ended up falling through. Kashi Yuta described Knuckles as, Sonic symbolizes speed, but Knuckles symbolizes power. He can break topography or land. He can climb up things and fly. Those were the requirements for the character features. In his shoes, which were speculated to be inspired by the Jamaican flag, have some actual backing because in the Sonic Advance 2 official strategy guide, it speaks about how Knuckles was originally supposed to have a Jamaican accent. Now that I think about it, gee, I wonder why his original design was green if he was supposed to be Jamaican. Hmm. 
Knuckles is a blast to play as. His gameplay is a lot more slower and more exploration based, using his knuckles to climb up walls and blast through areas that Sonic and Tails are not strong enough to break through. All these new areas lead to completely different sections of levels. This is amplified even more than the Tails campaign, as some of the level layouts are completely changed when playing as Knuckles. He also has the spin dash and a glide, which can take him to different areas and is frequently combined with climbing. Knuckles also has his own side of the story and bosses, so much so I felt his campaign deserved its own section, which we will get to in a bit. Each playthrough feels completely fresh and different, expanding the horizontal length of the zones like Sonic 2, and the vertical length of each zone like in Sonic CD. The zones in this blend the speed and reward of going fast with excellent slow, fast, and vertical platforming, also even some light puzzle work which is a refreshing pace breaker, along with dropping the little breadcrumbs to keep on going and see what could be right around the corner when it comes to exploring. When you find those hidden rooms holding those extra rings, lives, and power-ups, it never gets old. Another big change in the gameplay, other than the zone gimmicks, which I love mostly, are the new power-ups. Those being the elemental shields, which for some reason are either toned down or completely absent in the future games until more recently. Each shield is actually very useful and it feels like a lot of thought went into implementing these in tandem with the zones, as not only can they be used as a handicap for Sonic to reach certain areas that are generally easier for the more vertical and explorative characters like Tails and Knuckles, but also blend very naturally into the gameplay mechanics. These three new shields being the Thunder Shield, which is my personal favorite, gives Sonic a double jump along with being a magnet that attracts rings to the player and protects against electrical damage, like in Death Egg or in Carnival Night, but is vulnerable to water and when touching water the shield will disappear. The second shield being the Fire Shield, which protects Sonic from fire damage and is very useful in stages like Lava Reef or Angel Island Act 2, along with also giving the player a horizontal fireball attack which can be used offensively or to skip platforming sections and also break some objects. This shield is also vulnerable to water and will extinguish if underwater. The last new shield out of the trio being the Water Shield, which can repel Badnik fire projectiles, lets you breathe underwater, and also gives a bounce attack, which shoots the player straight down, and if done on a Badnik, will shoot the player up into the sky like a spring. These shields, while sounding like small changes, completely change the gameplay dynamic and also don't feel spoon fed at all, as in, say, uh, here's a lava section, um, we put a fire shield here, uh, what will you do? While well, obviously they place them in logical positions, but if used correctly, can really be a huge advantage, especially in platforming, whether it's reaching different areas due to one of the shield power-ups, or enhancing routes by negating the environmental effects like lava or water. When looking at the versions to play this, I'm going to talk about the versions that have both Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles, which aren't very many since Sonic 3 is kind of a cursed game, not getting many re-releases since Michael Jackson worked on the music, which I'll get into later. But anyways, the major ways to play this if you don't have a Genesis is by some of the late 90s to early 2000s Sonic collections, or through Steam, which is where I played it, but the port of the Sega Mega Drive and Genesis Classics version is flat out awful, with random frame drops and latency in the controls it feels like, but also allows for things like mods. I'm not going to be covering Sonic 3 Angel Island Reborn because it's not an official release. I understand a lot of people consider that one of the definitive versions to play Sonic 3 and Knuckles on, but I'm only focusing on the official releases. Anyways, I can't really not recommend any of these ports since they all get the job done and all not only include Sonic 3 and Knuckles, but also include Sonic 1, 2, and some of them even include CD. Sonic 3 and Knuckles has been re-released on the Sega Saturn, GameCube, PS2, PS3, OG Xbox, Xbox 360, Nintendo DS, and the Wii. All of these ports are pretty good from my understanding and would definitely recommend on your console of choice, but if I had to pick one, I'd probably recommend the Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection for the 360 and PS3, or a Sonic Mega Collection for the Xbox, PS2, and GameCube, as they have all the most features and the most games excluding the original trilogy. Actually, scratch that. The preferred way to play this is 100% with the Sonic and Garfield pack for Windows, which included Sonic 3 and Knuckles, along with other big hits like Baku Baku Animal, or Garfield Caught in the Act, which are, <laughs> are worth your time much more than this dumb Sonic 3 and <laughs> Knuckles game. I mean, come on now. Boo! You know why you clicked on this video. All right, guys, welcome back to my Garfield Caught in the Act Let's Play. The game really feels like a triumphant finale to the Genesis games on all fronts, including the story which feels like a natural progression from 1, 2, and CD, but also feels like the final climax of a story arc while setting the foundation for the future, similar to a shonen like Dragon Ball's evolution in Dragon Ball Z. That comparison drawing from Sonic 3 and Knuckles being the King Piccolo, Piccolo Jr. arcs of Dragon Ball, 
where a Sonic Adventure onwards being more closer aligned to Dragon Ball Z, both sequels taking the foundation of what came before it and redefining the scope and setting while being grounded in their universes. Enough about Sonic Adventure and Dragon Ball though, let me actually explain the story of this game, but keep that comparison in the back of your mind because I will come back to it later on. In the final moments of Sonic 2, when Sonic defeats Eggman and the destroyed Death Egg plummets towards the Earth, while Sonic and Tails shrug it off, their lackadaisicalness on finishing the job would set the stage for what is Sonic 3 and Knuckles. The Death Egg falls out of the sky, conveniently colliding with the fabled Angel Island, causing the island to collapse into the ocean. A few days later on South Island, Sonic finds an ancient ring on the shore from the aftermath of the island appearing from the water, showing a lost prophecy in ancient civilization powered by certain power stones the Chaos, Super, and Master Emeralds, which was then wiped out in an instant when the civilization tried to harness the energy of the Power Stones. After seeing this in the ring, Sonic, who has a feeling something is about to go down on this island, has his feelings confirmed when Tails' Emerald radar starts to go off, catching a strong Chaos Emerald signal, and the duo kickstart the tornado and head off to the fabled Angel Island to overcome their latest challenge and adventure. On the island, Dr. Robotnik, who also caught the Master Emerald signal, sets up shop trying to find and use the Master Emerald's power to rejuvenate the Death Egg, hopefully launching it back into the sky. Now enter the Guardian and Hermit of the Chaos Emeralds and Master Emerald, Knuckles the Echidna, who was knocked unconscious from the Death Egg Collision, and with the Chaos Emeralds magically disappearing due to them being in Sonic's possession from Sonic 2, he looks on to see the destroyed Death Egg floating in the water and remembering the prophecy of his people. When he is shocked to realize this large egg is the legendary Dragons, and realizing this egg is the one in Legend that will bring disaster to the island, and this supposed dragon who's explained in a later game if you catch my drift. Knuckles then encounters Robotnik, who fools him into believing Sonic stole the Emeralds and is looking to steal the highly coveted Master Emerald, thus setting the grand stage of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, that being the Sonic vs Knuckles rivalry and Robotnik's cunning manipulation to succeed in his plans to take the Master Emerald and the Emeralds for himself, and launch the Death Egg back into orbit. This game really makes Robotnik become much more than a generic villain, and a very scary foe in showing he's able to manipulate to his own will, and will do whatever he needs to do to succeed, no matter the cost. During the early creation process of the zones, Sonic Team wanted to take inspiration from real-world locations around them, completely designing a lot of the zones based on trips and places the team took together, which leads us to the opening of the game and the wonderful first zone, Angel Island, which was actually named after an island off the coast of San Francisco, but unfortunately did not feature Super Sonic and Tails flying towards the island when they visited it. Angel Island opens with Sonic and Tails flying towards it on their new adventure with Sonic getting cocky and going super showing off his new form, flying into the island before he's ambushed by Knuckles, now working for Eggman, who beats the absolute living shit out of him and then takes the emerald starting Act 1 of Angel Island. It's really neat. In the prototype for Sonic 3, there was originally a surfboard intro where instead of the traditional opening, Sonic would arrive on a surfboard and then would begin his adventure on the beach of Angel Island. Also, his sprite was based on his Sonic 2 one in this clip. In the community, a well-known hacker named Nemesis was able to revive the whole sequence along with Fred Bronze, who was another big Sonic ROM hacker in the community, who was able to load the sequence also using PAR codes. When talking about the zones, I'm going to change it up this time by describing the general gist of all of them to you right now, and as we progress through each, I will give the smaller details that I like from each one. All of the zones in Sonic 3 & Knuckles are peak Sonic level design, and that they all blend the slow, more precise platforming from Sonic 1. As an example, like puzzle work or tighter moving platforming areas you'd see from Marvel Zone, paralleled in a zone like Sandopolis, also blending the fast-paced, speed-focused sections from Sonic 2 like Chemical Plan or Emerald Hills loops and momentum building downward slopes that are exemplified through the game in, say, Angel Island with its big loops and giant ramps taking you across the gorgeous waterfall set pieces, and finally blending the exploration-based platforming and gameplay excellently from Sonic CD, which can be paralleled from the robot transporters and tricky hidden rooms to 3K perfecting it by leaving those little breadcrumbs to explore without going out of the way to find power-ups and openings to the special stages. I feel Sonic 3 & Knuckles is so well revered because it's able to do one of the hardest things in all of media, and that is appeasing every section of the fanbase, blending all the gameplay styles into one that works excellently with some of the most iconic stages and set pieces to exist in gaming. While it may not be everyone's favorite, I would be hard pressed to find anyone that says this game regressed any aspect of the 2D Sonic formula in any way. Anyways, let's get back to Angel Island. Angel Island is gorgeous, and my favorite 2D starting zone from the classics, also doing a wonderful job easing the player into how Sonic 3 plays and functions compared to its predecessors. This zone showcases exactly what Sonic Team meant by tripling the level size, giving expansive routes that even on my fifth playthrough of this game I still don't feel I found every little route using each character. Just for size comparison, take a look at this. Here's Angel Island, and here's the starting zone of Green Hill, Emerald Hill, and Palm Tree Panic. That's crazy, right? 
I love the set pieces in this, whether it was the giant waterfalls or the swing and zipline sections that take you across the areas and keep momentum going very well. Sonic running on the inside of a big tree or the really tricky but rewarding areas like pushing a rock to reveal some power-ups and don't even get me started on the excellent bosses in this game. At the end of each act, there is a mini boss along with generally a level transition to a different section of the zone that consists of act two. Not only is this giving us a whole different scenery in each zone, but also completely different music, giving us two times the amount of music seen before. The act one boss boss is a simple but really cool boss in my opinion, that being a giant floating tank looking thing that shoots flaming missiles at the group, but once defeated, torches the whole area giving us the first gorgeous transition this game shows, converting the once beautiful looking jungle landscapes of this section in Angel Island to the hellish burning ruins that Sonic and Tails must escape from, also changing the music for a more laid back and chill tropical feeling. to a more intense tropical feeling. Act 2 is awesome. Also showing the burning jungle as you progress your way through it, giving a lot more water sections and some slower platforming with the switch usage. As I said before, I love the section before the boss in this with the giant waterfall that you can scale, using the rocks that pop up from underneath it, giving you access to different areas that lead to some nice goodies. Before the boss, we see what is the new and improved flying battery from Sonic 2 coming low in altitude to try and bomb Sonic and Tails, with Robotnik coming to try and stop them. It's a really great setup for the first encounter with Robotnik. As the Act 2 boss starts, Robotnik is in a more souped up version of the floating tank from Act 1, this time shooting fireballs at the team, all with this gorgeous waterfall in the background. Did I mention the awesome boss music too. Overall, the bosses in 3K are, in my opinion, significantly harder than any of the other 2D bosses, as most of my boss fights ended with me having 0 to 1 rings at the end of the fight. This is good though, as I always would prefer more of a challenge. You can definitely see why this game took two cartridges, because they really pushed the envelope on what the Genesis could handle with the two different music variations for each act, the gorgeous and expansive levels, and the overall amount of content in this game. It's truly a marvel. And remember, this is on the same hardware that hosted Sonic 1 just a few years before, and the only other game to have this complexity in its soundtrack was CD, which obviously was on more advanced hardware. Once the fight is over, Sonic and Tails come upon a wooden bridge where the epic troller of the game, Knuckles, pops out for another sweet level transition, sending them down deep into Hydro City. Below the burning outer jungles of Angel Island, Sonic and Tails fall into the ancient submerged aqueducts of Hydro City, the main water level of Sonic 3, and on my first playthrough, I thought it was rather mid, but I love it to death now. There's so much to explore in this zone with its twisting ramps and water slides that really accentuate the speed factor of Sonic's gameplay, along with the nice set pieces and unique and expanding routes below and above water. When someone asks, what do you mean by exploration in a Sonic game? This would be probably one of the first zones I throw someone in and let them just have at it because there's so many hidden routes, power-ups, checkpoints that just feel so damn good finding, along with some of my favorite sections like taking the water slides above and underwater, where they let the team out, showcasing the speed of Sonic running on water like freaking Jesus. I really enjoy the Act 1 boss in this, and while it's quite easy as Sonic and Tails, I had major trouble with this as Knuckles. Since he's a heavier character, I didn't have the reach of Sonic. Anyways, this boss is a robot with a giant blender that will try to keep you underwater, and will also strafe from side to side on the walls, all while you have to dodge this and maintain your air underwater. It's a very fun boss, which transitions into the second act, which starts with the left wall closing in, and you need to escape the air area before being crushed, which opens to more Hydro City greatness. It wouldn't be a Sonic game without great music, and Hydro City gives some of the most iconic Act 1 and 2 tracks in the franchise. Act 1 giving a more laid back and jazzy feel. While Act 2 on the other hand is more fast paced and personally my favorite of the two, but both are excellent. Back to Knuckles comes back to send Sonic and Tails falling to the boss of the zone, which is another great boss that challenges the player in their platforming, like all platforming bosses should. That being, Robotnik strafes from left to right, dropping bombs that shoot spouts of water up and can be used as platforms to jump and hit Robotnik. Another excellent boss that is made a lot easier with Tails and harder with Knuckles. Once the boss is finished, a water spout shoots Sonic and Tails back to the surface, unfortunately to the worst zone in the classic games. This zone. <laughs> Oh my god, oh my god, it's terrible. 
And it's really unfortunate because the scenery and most ideas placed in this are excellent, along with a wide range of exploration that feels like a giant maze of ruins. But in practice, it's just not well executed, especially when playing as Sonic. As Knuckles, it's more tolerable, but oh my god, do the shitty spin top things that are required for certain sections to progress are just damn awful. And it wouldn't be that bad if A, these things controlled relatively well, but no, they don't. You tap left a little bit and they send you freaking flying or you try to go forward and barely move. And B, if you get hit once while on it, you need to go all the way back and restart. It feels this wasn't playtested much because it is just the biggest slog to go through. It makes me groan whenever I play this zone. I cannot begin to describe my frustration with this zone's shitty ass gimmick, which completely ruins the experience here, along with the more nuanced arrowhead shooter things, which just break pacing and aren't fun, especially when they're used as switches. As I said, I really like the design of this zone, giving a mix of what feels like Marble Zone and Aquatic Ruin for some really neat scenery designs and earthquakes caused by this giant drill robot, which ends up being the Act 1 boss after running into him a few times through the act. It's a pretty standard boss with a transition to Act 2. The music in this zone also is just okay. It gives a funky beat to Act 1. While Act 2 was slower, but I don't know why these songs kind of got on my nerves, but it could just be because I was so frustrated with this zone. Act 2, for the most part, is just more shit until you run into roboting with a drill who causes an earthquake, having the place start to collapse as you slowly escape the breaking pillars to one of the coolest bosses in the franchise, that being Tails carrying Sonic where you need to dodge and fight Robotnik in midair. It has easily become one of my favorite bosses. I didn't realize how to control Tails' altitude though, so I spent like 6 minutes after beating the boss trying to hit the capsule. Once you finally hit the capsule, Sonic and Tails then fly off into the night, transitioning us into a much, much better zone. Aw, hell yeah. I hated this zone when I first played this game, but I am in love with Carnival Night now. Not only is this one of the weirdest zones in the classics, but fills the role for the casino zone in this game. And it's an absolute blast and probably one of my favorite and the, one of the most glitzy zones in the 16-bit era I've ever seen. Carnival Night is actually based off of multiple roaming carnivals in the California area, and it also feels low-key kind of creepy for some reason. I don't know, maybe it's just me because I'm not the biggest clown guy. Carnival Night has a lot of tricky platforming, along with some nice speed sections and some unique platforming gimmicks, like the areas where you need to jump to increase the verticality of the platform, or the cool yellow spring coils that you can go in and get shot out of in another area. Which reminds me of the pipe system in Quartz Quadrant, or just the general carnival fanfare like cannons, balloons, and such, which really help build a unique aesthetic to the zone. And while feeling like a very cramped zone, it's actually not. There's a lot of different areas and pathways that lead to shortcuts or rings and such. Sonic and Tails at the end of Act 1 fall into a descending elevator shaft with a rather challenging boss, who shoots a spinning spike platform that slowly destroys the ground you stand on, while also emitting electricity. So what you need to do is hit the thing when it's not emitting electricity, which opens it up for the spike platform to come in and hit it. Once this is done, the elevator stops and you're greeted with Act 2. I love the music in this zone. A, because Michael Jackson supposedly worked on it, and B, it's just so out there but catchy as all get out, as the first act is a freaky remix of the typical carnival song, Entrance of the Gladiators, which actually reappears to a certain extent in Shadow the Hedgehog's Circus Park level. Act 2, on the other hand, is a similar remix that changes the pacing of the song, but that's really it. Act 2 is really cool as it adds a lot of unique variety like there being a whole water section which I found kind of neat in a carnival setting especially, and Knuckles coming and turning the lights off which gives an eerie feeling to the zone as you progress through the act, giving a completely different aesthetic to the whole zone. I can't talk about this zone without bringing up Act 2's notorious La Barrel of Doom, which got to me on my first playthrough too, taking me three time overs, which is 30 minutes by the way, in total, and a guide on how to get past this part. Anyways, at the end of Act 2, you meet up with Robotnik again, who has a really fun boss fight in my opinion, that being he drops a giant orb you have to dodge, and he comes over and emits electricity around it, giving you a small window to attack as he is lower to the ground. Tails helps a lot in this one, but once this is done, the duo leap into a cannon that shoots them all the way out to the snowy central mountains of Angel Island. But the question lingers. Will we ever know why is there a giant carnival on the supposedly untouched and deserved Angel Island? Hmm, probably never.
Yeah, and some people say Sonic has never been cool. Ice Cap is probably my favorite out of the Sonic 3 side, and up there for one of my favorite in the franchise. It's such a, no pun intended, but cool. <laughs> and unique setting we haven't seen before at the time this was made, along with that ridiculously sweet intro transition. It hypes me up every time. Ice Cap was one of the big zones affected by the two-part split, which Yuji Naka himself explains how it was affected and where the idea of this zone came from. While developing, we went snowboarding a lot at a nearby resort. People kept getting injured though. Originally, this stage was planned to begin after Zone 8, Flying Battery Zone. Sonic was going to break down the door from the airship and make a snowboard out of it on the way down. The other characters can fly, so they wouldn't appear in that event. Pretty interesting that not only Flying Battery Zone was going to be in Sonic 3, but also Ice Cap was going to take place after it. I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but I cannot get over the beauty of this zone. Inside the caves, and especially outside, like, oh my god. I love this zone so much and how it's able to blend slow pace, tight platforming so well with set pieces and areas of high speed like the opening, going around loops outside, flying across the stalagmites on the giant hunk of ice, or running across the submerged ice pillars, this zone is such a treat to play, and never gets old. I also love the little details in not only this zone, but all of the zones, like for example, how all the power-ups are frozen in a block of ice, or how all the badniks are arctic-themed. These little touches, I feel, really make these zones stand apart from the rest, other than being absolutely fantastic. That helps too. I really like the Act 1 boss a lot, as it reminds me of CD and Sonic 2's boss when Robotnik had those orbs around him, but this time they actually do something, and you need to dodge the robot attacks while also timing your attacks when the window is right. It's a super fun boss that leads to Act 2, which takes place outside mostly, dealing a lot more with speed and some fun, tighter platforming. I really enjoyed the spring sections here, which shoot you up to the surface, while also offering expansive routes depending on your skill throughout the game. The music at this zone is top tier, becoming a host to a lot of fan remixes, which are absolutely excellent. Act 1 actually features two different melodies that alternate between each other, making one of the most iconic songs in Sonic history. While Act 2 slows it down a bit to a more calmer pace, much like the much calmer and still backgrounds of Act 2, with the ice floating in the water. Ice Cap ends with a rather tough boss being Robotnik's freeze add-on, which extends downward and shoots off freezing gas which you have to dodge, but the timing is tricky since the direction order he shoots them in will change and throw my timing off. I love the little expressions of Sonic and the gang here as they get frozen too, it's always been so amusing to me for some reason. After defeating Robotnik here, the group follows him back to the crash site of the Death Egg, where the final chapter of Sonic 3 begins. Sonic Team somehow beat Sega of Japan and Sonic CD for making the most 90s looking design in music, taking the throne from Wacky Workbench, the biggest accomplishment in all of gaming of course. Launch Base Zone is such a great final zone, it's such a cool concept seeing the Death Egg's crash site in the background as it's getting prepped for launch back into orbit with the giant cranes and such while Sonic and Tails are trying to stop it. Really awesome premise that sets the stakes so well in my opinion. I loved everything about this zone really. I feel it's a great final zone because it blends the gameplay perfectly, offering multiple routes, a lot of speed sections, some slower, more precise platforming sections, while also being somewhat difficult to perfect due to its more maze-like nature, even offering a whole underwater section along with being able to go inside the water pipes that take you to different areas and such. I also like the crane zipline thing, which was really cool along with the spinny yellow cups which take you to new sections, and the use of switches in this that can open or close certain areas depending on when you use the switch. It's a really fun zone that challenges the player fairly, with no artificial difficulty bullcrap, and the Act 1 boss is no different. But before that, Sonic and Tails run into Knuckles, who legit throws a bomb at them and laughs at your presumed death before running off. Yup, Knuckles, you trolled them. And it was epic. The Act 1 boss is another fun challenge. That being, a giant robot Robotnik unleashes on you that spins spikes in both directions. After hitting it a few times, each arm will break off till the final hit kills the whole thing. I really like the music in this as it feels very 90s, but it's very catchy for Act 1, using a real funky, mechanical sound, while also remixing into it, which works very well for some reason. <laughs> The same can be said for Act 2 also, which sounds very similar. Act 2 is more of Act 1, but what's interesting to me is that the zone actually gets a whole redesign with Sonic and Knuckles, so if you only had Sonic 3, the zone was a lot different which changed some things like switch placement and some rooms. As you progress through the act, you run into Robotnik again, 
for the first of three Act 2 bosses. This one being incredibly easy, where you just need to dodge a spear and hit Robotnik. Once this is done, Robotnik falls off screen, and Sonic takes Robotnik's cockpit and runs into Knuckles at the base of the booster rockets for the Death Egg, where Knuckles falls off his scaffolding platform. Due to the blast off as the Death Egg relaunches into orbit and Sonic flies over to a small red platform that is connected to the Death Egg with hopes of stopping it once again. That is, before Robotnik comes back with his second Act 2 boss fight, which is another relatively easy but fun battle where Robotnik has a triple-layered rocket machine thing that you need to attack the cockpit while dodging his laser guns and spike balls that orbit around the scientist. As you wear down the machine, it'll lose layer after layer until nothing is left. The wear and tear from the battle reaches the Death Egg and causes it to implode into flames falling down to the island once again. There is one more boss in the 3K version, which is what I played, but only Knuckles fights the original Sonic 3 final boss. That being Big Arms, which I'll talk about in the Knuckles campaign section. Anyways, Sonic looks onto the destruction of the Death Egg, which closes the book on the first part of Sonic 3 and moves us over to Sonic and Knuckles, which starts with... Mushroom Hill, originally called Mushroom Valley, starts right where Sonic 3 left off with Tails carrying Sonic to safety after the collapse of the Death Egg, landing in the zone and running into Knuckles where we see him looking mischievous as all trolls do, coming out of a hidden room. As Sonic and Tails, this hidden room ends up being a portal to the Emerald Shrine and Hidden Palace, where the Master Emerald lies and when giving the Chaos Emeralds to the Shrine, reveal the unrestored Super Emeralds. Doing this also relinquishes Sonic's ability to go Super. It's now up to Sonic and Tails to recollect the Chaos, now Super Emeralds, to hopefully restore peace to Angel Island and bring a stop to Robotnik. I really like this as it not only adds more lore to the Emeralds, but shows our characters' motives right off the bat of Part 2, showing us what the central plot will revolve around going through Sonic and Knuckles. Then this transitions us to the actual zone, which is a blast. I love Mushroom Hill. While in my opinion, it's not as good overall as Angel Island, it's still a 10 out of 10 zone in my opinion. Like all Sonic 3 zones, Sonic and Knuckles, along with Mushroom Hill, continue the trend of all the zones having these expansive levels that offer much different routes each playthrough, along with blending the speed, exploration, and platforming pillars perfectly. Everything Mushroom Hill offers hits the nail right on the head in my opinion. I really like the gimmicks in this zone, like the speed-based swings, mushroom-based seesaws, which all kept momentum going, except for the large pump devices, and enhanced the zone in my opinion. While mainly being a speed-focused zone, I really like the big vine loop set pieces and such, which really accentuated this zone, along with there being so many hidden areas, special stage openings, and power-ups to find. It's an absolute blast to play through. The Act 1 boss is also really unique and great in my opinion, that being the Lumberjack robot, which has a giant axe and chops a tree shooting the logs at you. Once you defeat the Lumberjack boss, the group runs into Knuckles again, who uses a giant fan to blow the team all the way to Act 2. I love this transition to Mushroom Hill. As you get closer and closer to the satellite at the end of Act 2 that's sucking the life out of the zone, it gets bleaker and more decayed and less colorized until you break it and then the zone goes back to that bright lively green from Act 1. The presentation and scenery of the zone is gorgeous. The music is also top notch, giving a more cheerful and bouncy vibe to match the more swampish jungle in Act 1. while Act 2 switches it up a bit, giving a more fast-paced and remixed version of Act 1. The Act 2 boss is one of my favorite in the game, and while being an auto-scroller, which I'm normally not a fan of, it's very fun having to dodge these spikes and Robotnik's heat blast while trying to hit him. Once defeated, we see in all of its glory, the full return of the flying battery where Sonic and Tails barely jump on, leading to the next zone. This is certainly no Wing Fortress from Sonic 2. While the flying battery comes back from its grave after Sonic 2, this new rendition of it is hands down one of my favorite zones ever. Sonic and Knuckles doesn't miss once. Flying battery improves on everything I hated about the Sonic 2 version, that being, there's an actual direction in the zone now, the climbing sections are actually fun and don't have Sonic jumping off the rungs like a brick, and just overall, expanding the level making a really dramatic and fun zone that is a treat to play through every time. I love everything this zone does, blending its speed sections excellently with some slower sections that break the pacing quite well, like the spiral elevator things along with having a lot of tricky but rewarding secrets to find. One of my favorite being the spikes you can push out of the way to reveal a special stage entrance. Tails and Knuckles add a whole different layer of exploration to this zone too, which it caters to a lot. Flying Battery is more of a straightforward zone, taking the team inside and outside the fortress in different areas, while also blending the 2D pillars excellently, even in this more cramped nature which I feel shows the strengths of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, in that not every zone needs to be this giant expansive level, and that some more straightforward and more intense zones can not only fit, but actually enhance the pacing of the game overall. 
One of the more smaller things I liked was the little section where you have to let the bombs falling on you open the next section, which was a neat and clever addition. I love the design and feeling this zone gives of blitzing through this giant maze of a fortress, and all while I do think it would have been really cool seeing this in Sonic 3 before Ice Cap, this kicks part 2 up a big notch and it fits perfectly here also. And the music. Oh my god, it's great. Act 1 is a very dramatic but fast paced electronic bit that fits the stage perfectly. While Act 2 remixes it a bit and enhances the Act 1 version, adding some different pieces to it, and also being one of my favorite video game music selections ever. The Act 1 boss, while easy, I thought was a really cool idea and different idea, which is executed quite well. The capsule is actually the boss this time, where you need to hit it itself on the button until it dies. It is really easy but fun, and a nice transition to Act 2. The second part of Flying Battery is just more great platforming with the flame shooting springs, magnetic bars and coils that Sonic and friends can run through, leading us to the end of Act 2, where Sonic and Tails are stuck in Robotnik's Flying Battery cockpit, and have to dodge this giant blue laser, giving us a nice remixed callback to Sonic 2's Wing Fortress final fight. This laser ends up single-handedly destroying the Flying Battery, which then starts the collapse of the ship where you need to escape as it crumbles behind you in danger of crushing the whole team. Once you reach the final platform, this is where the actual Act 2 boss begins, that being this giant swing Robotnik controls. I love this boss, as you need to time your hits when he swings up without hitting the flames. It's a great boss in my opinion that offers a fun challenge. Once defeated, Sonic and Tails kick a window out and jump back down to Angel Island landing in a much different setting. When I think of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, for some reason, Sandopolis is one of the first zones that pops into my mind. Not really sure why, as I do love this zone, but it's certainly not my favorite in the 14 listed here. Sandopolis is an explorer's dream, being one of the zones I had the most fun exploring overall, even offering completely new areas when playing as Knuckles. Whether it's Act 1 or 2, the openness of this zone really works in its benefit, as there is so much to find, and when I thought I explored the whole area, I kept on finding new places. This is the only zone where I had consistent time overs, which I wasn't mad at at all because it was just due to me just walking around and checking the whole place out. Sandopolis breaks the pacing in this game quite a bit, feeling like it was ripped straight out of Sonic 1's design book. With its much slower platforming and almost puzzle-like design, it's really a blast to play. Act 1 opens in the arid deserts of Angel Island, giving a much different scenery than what we were normally used to, along with each act being long as shit. Act 1 takes place outside, where we get to see this really cool sand waterfalls, huge areas, slower and somewhat more vertical platforming, and my personal favorite set piece of this zone being the areas where Sonic is scaling down the giant pillars littered around the zone. I thought this was a cool touch because it shows here just how huge these ruins are. The end of Act 1 leads us outside to the main boss, which I really enjoyed, although very easy, the rock statue which guards the pyramid. This boss consists of leading the Guardian into the giant sand pit to the left. Once defeated, Sonic and Tails enter the pyramid to transition us into Act 2. The music in this zone certainly gives off that Egyptian vibe which was originally captured very well in Oil Ocean's track from Sonic 2. Act 1 gives a much more menacing and magical melody with the slower paced beat. while Act 2 gives us a much more spooky remix of Act 1 due to the ghost. I really liked how the Act 1 takes place outside, while the Act 2 of this zone takes us inside the pyramid. I thought that was a really cool progression throughout the zone. Act 2 is really interesting, as it adds this new mechanic of darkness, causing ghosts to pop out at you, and you need to manage your light much like managing your oxygen underwater, which causes the player to make some split second decisions regarding making their trek from light switch to light switch, or oxygen bubble to oxygen bubble. All while traveling through this slower, more puzzle-like level which is also massive. I thought it was a fun spin on the gameplay mechanics to keep things fresh and engaging. Not that this game isn't engaging though. The puzzles, and I say that hesitantly because they mainly consist of pushing a switch, breaking a sand cap to bring the elevation up, or pushing a rock all to get through the door before it closes. This is mixed up a bit at the latter half of the act as the pyramid starts collapsing causing you to have to be quick with the switch work to get out alive and not get trapped by the sand. 
At the end of Act 2, you'll drop down to the boss, this time being the Egg Golem, where Robotnik is inside this giant brick statue and slowly pushes the duo closer and closer to the wall to crush them. To defeat him, you need to hop on his arm and then hit the Golem, causing Robotnik to be revealed where you can get some actual hits in. It's crazy to think how much of this zone comes back, or at least bears a lot of similarities in, at least some extent to Sonic Adventure 2, like the ghosts, the Egg Golem, time doors, and the whole aesthetic. After defeating the boss, the floor collapses, leading us to another fantastic zone. Lava Reef is another one of my all-time favorite zones. It just blows my mind a large majority of these iconic Sonic zones came out of Sonic 3 and Knuckles. As Sandopolis broke the pacing nicely, Lava Reef puts us back on track full steam ahead. In both acts, it blends all the core Sonic pillars to a T, along with its beautiful design with the scorching lava, molten caves, and claustrophobic rock tunnels that take you through Act 1, while Act 2 shows the progression deeper in the cavern, with these gorgeous bluish-purple obsidian gatherings on the walls, pretty crystals, and the colder, more icy feeling the act displays with the different shades of blue brought out through this zone. The Drill Guy from Marble Garden makes his grand return in the beginning of Act 1, kicking off the chaos that unfolds in this zone. As the duo progresses through Lava Reef and its gorgeous lava falls, crumbling rock platforms, multiple shifting platforms, hidden areas and routes, all getting deeper and deeper into the zone as the Death Egg looms in the background. They run across Robotnik in a giant mech with these two tentacle-like arms coming out and shooting lasers at the group. As it rises, this is a main window to attack it. Once the tentacles retreat, the big mech hand will drop down, foreshadowing something to come later on, which gives a window to attack while it's down. After it's destroyed, the duo proceeds onward to Act 2. The music is so good in this. Act 1, like a lot of the tracks, is more upbeat and dramatic, giving a very, very catchy melody with it. While Act 2 is a lot more mystical and heavenly, while breaking down the beat from the first act a bit. Act 2's music perfectly foreshadows the soon-to-come run-in with the Master Emerald in its tone, along with being Hidden Palace's theme. Act 2 is a lot more slower paced due to a lot more moving platforms, crushing blocks, fire exhaust ports, and such. This continues on until we run into Le Epic Troll again, this time not holding a palm, but a boulder, which topples sending Sonic and Tails down. Bruh, these poor guys fall everywhere. <laughs> the Act 2 boss in this is fantastic. As the duo fall, you see the freshly crashed Death Egg in the background, absolutely motionless. That is, until its eyes light up, completely torching the icy caverns to a giant burning hellhole. Speaking of Act transitions, I love the little details showing the progression in the zones, like how in Act 1, the Death Egg is barely visible, while as you make your way through Lava Reef to where you are now, it goes from being barely visible to us being right on top of the Space Fortress, Really cool way to environmentally tell the progression throughout the zone. As for the boss, Robotnik then comes down shooting missiles at the duo as you need to evade and platform your way to the fight. I love this section so much as it sets up a fighting arena, along with giving a unique and challenging section to go through before the fight. It's also awesome, you're dodging rockets over pits of lava, like what else could you want? As you progress across and down the giant lava falls, which by the way holds a couple of secrets on the way down like a fire shield to trivialize this fight. As Sonic and Robotnik are on the same playing field now, Robotnik then turns the tide of the lava so it's at an incline where Sonic needs to jump from platform to platform while avoiding him and his attacks. What hurts Robotnik here is the spike balls he shoots which ends up being his demise in the fight. I love this boss so much as it's another really unique and fun way to challenge the player's platforming skills which 3k does often and it hits perfectly almost every time. As the lava settles, the group heads to the original resting place of the mysterious and very legendary Master Emerald. While not really being a zone, I would argue this is one of the most important sections of the game for one sole purpose, storytelling. Coming from Lava Reef, Sonic and Tails progress through the ancient palace they found themselves in, till running into Knuckles of course, who it's time for the final showdown between the two. 1v1, Hedgehog vs Echidna. One side looking to get this troll out of the way while the other side is looking to protect his people and his people's holy possession. Also giving us our first non-metallic living and breathing organism fight in the franchise. Sonic vs Knuckles. The ying to the game's yang, you could say. Okay, sorry, I'll stop being dramatic. This fight is really easy as it's basically just hitting Knuckles on the head a couple of times till he goes down. All with this giant mural in the background of an echidna prophecy of a spiky blue figure ticking down a giant beast who holds the Master Emerald. Hmm, I wonder what this could mean. 
as the troller, now Trolley, gets wrecked with the final blow. A bunch of explosions halt the fight as shit is definitely going down in the Master Emerald room where Knuckles, Sonic, and Tails run in to see Robotnik 20D chess move of having the idiots fight amongst themselves so he can get what he wants. This is what I'm talking about with the great character development by fleshing out and showing how cunning and ruthless Robotnik can be by fooling them all and taking the Master Emerald to repower the Death Egg, all while Sonic and Tails can just look onwards thinking, well, shit. And the best part about this is, this is all done with no dialogue. As Knuckles tries to stop him, ending up with a pretty brutal wave of electricity going through the dude's body, as Robotnik flies off to successfully claim the powerful stone as his own. The now weakened Knuckles realizing he's been double-crossed by the scientist, and too beaten to continue on his own, recognizes that the only way to stop Robotnik now is to team up with the same two people he's been fighting the whole game. Putting their beef aside, a new friendship slowly starts to blossom between the trio, starting with Knuckles taking Sonic and Tails to the entrance up to Sky Sanctuary, realizing this is their last ditch effort to retrieve the Master Emerald, save Angel Island, and destroy the Death Egg once and for all. As the trio now transitions from the icy caverns of Lava Reef and Hidden Palace to the sunlight and serene ruins of Sky Sanctuary, with the Death Egg rising up into orbit in the background, Knuckles, who is barely moving at this point, summons just enough strength to hit the switch to open the bridge for the duo to try and save the day, because now it's all up to Sonic and Tails. No pressure, right? While this looks like the final chapter for Knuckles, don't worry, we're going to be coming back to you soon. Sky Sanctuary, although short, being only one act, I feel it is perfect at this length because it does a great job as a transition zone in terms of helping set up the stakes of the Death Egg, while also giving a stark contrast to it and being an excellent pace breaker and a palate cleanser for lack of a better word from the underground lava, ruins, and sand that filled the last three zones. While also technically getting the second act in the Knuckles story, Sonic and Tails have to make their way through the ethereal ruins high up in the sky passing beautiful fountains and overgrowth. I also really like the teleporter things in this too as they look cool. The music is fantastic, also really emphasizing that holy, magical, and airy feelings this zone gives, while also still having that very dramatic hint, knowing there's a huge mission at stake here. Robotnik is not going to let anyone easily get on the Death Egg. Anticipating Sonic and Tails are right behind him, he drops his best out on the field. That being the newly refined and upgraded Mecha Sonic from Sonic 2. There's three boss fights at this zone in Sonic and Tails' story, and why I bring this up is because this feels like a very fitting homage of the first three games as we're about to reach the finale of the conclusion of the first arc in the Sonic franchise. The first boss fight, which I feel represents Sonic 1, is the Green Hill Zone fight where Robotnik, now Mecha Sonic, uses the other ball as a wrecking ball. Once this is defeated, he transforms into the second boss, using the clone orbs from the Metropolis Zone boss fight from Sonic 2, which I feel represents Sonic 2 in this analogy, and once that is defeated, finally, the third and final boss of this gauntlet being a 1v1 rematch against Mecha Sonic, also from Sonic 2. I love this fight, as it's kind of tough, but basically consists of dodging his attacks till he's standing still, which is your window to go on the offense. In this analogy, I feel Mecha Sonic actually represents Sonic CD in the sense of the 1v1 race against Metal Sonic. All this really puts everything into perspective that in the beginning, it was just a simple fight to stop industrialization in Sonic 1, and now it's a fight to save the world, showing just how far the group has come. As Mecha Sonic is defeated, the platform begins to crumble, having Sonic do one last ditch effort to descend the crumbling pillar and do a leap of faith onto the Death Egg. Which leads us to our final zone. This is it. It's now or never. Sonic has somehow made it onto the Death Egg before reaching orbit. To say I love this zone is an absolute understatement. I really like the contrast with Sky Sanctuary here, as Sky Sanctuary is a naturally beautiful and heavenly-like zone, while the Death Egg is a mechanically sleek, cool-looking, and completely man-made zone, giving this dark and sinister feeling to it. It really feels like a final showdown and a cap to the Genesis Sonic arc. It's also my favorite final 2D Sonic zone, hands down. It's really cool seeing the revived Death Egg as a zone this time, instead of just being a boss arena, like in Sonic 2. Act 1 mainly takes you inside the egg, showing the gorgeous backdrop of the mechanisms keeping the station running, or the beautiful planet Mobius in the background. Through Act 1, there are so many crazy things going on, whether it's the really cool looking light ring sets, to the elevator conveyor belt platforms, or the crazy changes in gravity which I really enjoyed as they felt like a challenge to the player's platforming skills, with having to progress on the ceiling and execute your jumps on a different plane than normally. As Sonic makes it to the end of Act 1, you're faced with one of the more tougher bosses in the game, that being this big terminal that shoots these giant spears at you while you're aiming to hit the glowing red eye he has. Once you get it really pissed is when things start getting tough though, as the terminal will detach itself, becoming a moving spike laser shooting beast 
that you need to dodge and hit in the same spot. Once this is done, Sonic will then zap up to a higher section, more entrenched than the Death Egg for Act 2. The music in the Death Egg is also excellent. Act 1 perfectly captures the dramatic, fast-paced, metallic feeling this zone gives off. While Act 2 is very similar to Act 1, but it's just more high-pitched. Listen here. Both acts in this zone, while seeming very narrow and straightforward due to the nature of what this zone is story-wise, actually offer very expansive levels catering towards all three pillars of Sonic gameplay that make this zone so damn fun. Act 2 is more outside the Death Egg with Mobius in the background showing what is at stake here, and a lot more anti-gravity sections which, like I said, were a blast. Yuji Naka explains the thought process of these sections here which is located in the Sonic Jam official guide. When thinking of space, gravity controls come to mind. So that was what the theme behind this stage was. We tried to give it a feel you could only have in outer space. How did we do? We surveyed many people to determine if up and down should be reversed when the gravity flips. I guess that is just easier to have pressing down to crouch feel natural. As we make it towards the end of Act 2, we have the final mini-boss that is the definition of tedious. Robotnik controls this large ball that shoots out spiked robots, which are the only things that hurt the robot. So this basically comes down to just switching between the two gravity states to hit the boss with its own robots, which doesn't sound bad, but when the bots can only be effective on their top side, it becomes very annoying having to switch between up, down, up, down, up, down multiple times. In my opinion, this is the weakest boss in the game because it just takes so long while just not being fun or really that engaging. As you defeat this machine, Robotnik then starts to flee to the actual final boss being the Great Eggman Robot, which I'll call the Gur here, which is actually the giant mech from Lava Reef. The first phase of this boss is very easy, as it's a retread from the Lava Reef fight, and having the Gur's hands clamped down on the ground, you need to fight its fingers. But it gets tricky on the second phase when Robotnik opens the Gur's chest up, shooting a huge laser. The trick to this fight is actually attacking the laser while it's charging, because it opens the Master Emerald up to be attacked and knocked out of the robot. Once you land the last hit, Robotnik will rise up from the wreckage to steal the Master Emerald in a last-ditch effort, but you can stop him this time, almost putting a foil to his plan as the surrounding area begins to collapse around the two, turning to white. Sonic unleashes incredible Emerald forces in this final shattering showdown with Robotnik, a fitting excerpt from the Sonic & Knuckles US manual. It all comes down to this. After collecting all Chaos and Super Emeralds, the final showdown between Sonic and Robotnik begins to excellently cap off the original Trill or Quadrilogy, as Sonic goes hyper for the first time and only time in the franchise, chasing Robotnik down to recapture the Master Emerald all behind the ruins of the now-defeated Death Egg. In Doomsday Zone, the first phase of this boss consists of Hypersonic traversing through an asteroid belt, dodging missiles and collecting rings to keep his hyper timer up. Once you reach Robotnik's mech, Hypersonic then needs to dodge the lasers being shot at him, while leading the missiles that Robotnik is shooting back at the doctor's cockpit. This section was always tricky for me, as I would never angle the missiles correctly and they would miss Robotnik's hitbox. Once you get 8 missiles on Robotnik, there is the third and final phase of Doomsday Zone, consisting of Robotnik's final attempt to flee with the Master Emerald, ridding himself of the destroyed mech shell, now fleeing in the Death Egg robot as Hypersonic catches him and destroys the smaller mech leaving Robotnik stranded in space and Hypersonic catching the Master Emerald and slowly making his way down to Mobius as the tornado catches him and we are shown Sonic and Tails flying around Angel Island and re-delivering the Master Emerald back to safekeeping with the now rival turned friend Knuckles the Echidna. As the game closes, we see Sonic and Tails fly off into the ocean with dolphins and other animals trailing them and Sonic jumping off the tornado giving us the iconic Hypersonic thumbs up, signifying the day is saved in the story slash classic arc can come to a well-deserved closed. Until the next adventure. I love this final zone, as I really enjoyed the supersonic fight, as it's actually a little challenging with having to angle the missiles, also while avoiding the bullets so you don't get pushed back with having to collect rings to keep your time up also. It made for a challenging but excellent send-off giving finality to the classic games and just being an absolute blast to play. Knuckles' campaign takes place after Sonic and Tails' campaign and is another run through the zones ending at Sky Sanctuary this time. 
While sounding like a rehash, it feels like the furthest thing from it, with the new bosses, areas, cutscenes, level transitions. Like, instead of Knuckles trapping Sonic and Tails to fall down into Hydro City, Knuckles just jumps off the bridge down there himself. And it also gives us a new story featuring the Egg Robo as the main antagonist instead of Robotnik this time. It feels like a fresh epilogue to just a fantastic base game. In this section, I'm going to go over the major differences, mainly highlighting the different bosses and story elements that are in the Knuckles campaign. The opening cutscene is actually different in the Sonic and Knuckles only version, which opens at Mushroom Hill with Knuckles being disturbed from the Egg Robo trying to kill him. You know, as you do. But instead, we start at Angel Island where the story is basically just chasing the Egg Robo through the zones till the end, which changes it up. Knuckles' campaign is considered the hard mode, as he's a bit more weighty and slower, which can really affect some of the more precise jumps. A perfect example of this is the Act 1 Hydro City boss compared to Sonic. This is counterbalanced with the new glide ability he has, which opens all the levels up. All the zones feel fresh and new with the completely different areas Knuckles is able to access. Some of my favorites being Sandopolis' Act 2, Angel Island overall, Lava Reef overall, Marble Garden surprisingly, and Hydro City, which are all great examples of showing how Knuckles' exploration-based gameplay shines throughout all the zones. Not only leading to new areas, but also leading to some only Tails and Knuckles can get to. Like some giant ring areas, which was really cool, I thought. I 100% recommend running through Knuckles' campaign, as it gives the complete experience, which I missed out on when first playing this game. Also, did you know, Knuckles' theme actually changed from Sonic 3 to Sonic & Knuckles. Sonic 3's theme sounding much worse, in my opinion. compared to the iconic Sonic and Knuckles theme. Marble Garden is where things start to really split boss and story-wise, with the new Act 2 boss being the Egg Robo, which leaves tracks of spiked balls in front of it, and you need to time your attacks to when he glides across the screen. It's a really fun boss that, while on paper sounds very easy, actually has a bit of challenge to it, making a fun replacement for the normal Act 2 boss of this section. Carnival Knight does not feature an Act 2 boss fight, and instead transitions straight to Ice Cap where he has a lot of his own exclusive areas, along with having some of the same boss fights, but the Act 1 version being inside the caves instead of out. Launch Base Zone offers a completely different ending area, with the aforementioned Big Arms fight happening, which I thought was a really cool fight with some great music. Robotnik glides around in this new mohawk-styled mech where you need to dodge his attacks and hit him. It's pretty easy, but fun. Lava Reef is the next big boss change. There also being no boss here, as Knuckles just continues on to Hidden Palace, which also has no boss fight, but just the teleporter to Sky Sanctuary. The story, while being simple, has a very awesome conclusion at Sky Sanctuary. The Egg Robo in Robotnik's cockpit captures Knuckles and brings him to Mecha Sonic, who not only kills the Egg Robo, but fights Knuckles one-on-one -on -one with the gorgeous Angel Island floating in the background, depicting all that is at stake here. The first phase of this boss is pretty standard Mecha Sonic fare, until he hops onto the Master Emerald. The Doomsday music kicks in, and he goes super, seeing our first appearance of a super bad guy, and it blew my mind when this happened, as I had no clue this boss fight was even a thing. Heck, I thought it was just a fan-made thing. Super Mecha Sonic is a lot harder to deal with since he has a new moveset and has a lot of projectile attacks. He is vulnerable when not in his super form, which is far and few in between, but after landing about 6 hits, he's finally defeated, ending Knuckles' campaign and showing Knuckles holding the Master Emerald on top of the tornado, being bros with Sonic as Angel Island continues to safely rise in the sky and Knuckles does his hypersonic pose. This campaign is incredible, and I really like the continuity with the main story, showing that it takes place after Sonic's story. Some examples being like how in Sandopolis Act 2, the ghosts only get loose in Sonic's story once he releases them. While in Knuckles' story, the ghosts are already out, showing that Sonic has already been there. Some other examples include the whole area in Hidden Palace since there's no Sonic fight, although I thought that would have been cool since I would like to see Knuckles' point of view when it comes to a Sonic fight. And a final example being all of Sky Sanctuary. Angel Island has already risen, and I thought these were some of the many cool details that kept continuity with the main story, and it was neat seeing this. That's all of Knuckles' campaign though. I tried to give a brief summary of it, but it's definitely worth a playthrough as it's super fun and keeps everything fresh. The 
The special stages, while not themselves being my favorite in the franchise, the method of getting to them 100% is. In 3K, there are no 50 rings to the end of the level nonsense. Nope, this time throughout each act, there are multiple hidden giant rings throughout the level that can be discovered and lead to an opportunity for a special stage. I love this method, as it really encourages the player to explore and find the hidden rings, similarly to how in Sonic CD you need to find the hidden robot transporters for each act. Once finding a giant ring, the stages are the classic pseudo 3D look, but this time without the aggravation of the Sonic 2 special stages, and the trippiness of Sonic CD's special stages. The Blue Sphere stages are very simple, but executed in a very fun and entertaining way, that being you need to collect the blue spheres in each stage without touching the red ones which take you out of the stage, all while the speed of the player's movement increases, also having to increase the player's reaction time. This sounds super easy, and for the most part, they're a lot easier than, say, Sonic CD stages, but still offer a challenge that unless you're able to combo the spears in, say, a square, the blue will turn to red, giving you more hazards to watch out for, as the longer in the stage you spend, the faster you'll go. Throw that in with the bumper spears, which change your direction either going backwards or forwards, and the yellow spears, which are like the springs that shoot the player across the stage. It all makes for very fun, challenging, and especially fair stages. In these stages, I never felt like I was duped out of the stage like in, say, Sonic 2. Ah. Each mistake feels like your own and something you can learn from when reattempting the stages. Once finishing them in Sonic 3, you get Super Sonic to play with, which is super fun, of course. Haha, <laughs> get it? None of Super Sonic's moves or handling change here, so I don't really think I need to go into it. He's a blast to play, 50 rings to get him, yada yada yada. Things get interesting once you transition to Sonic and Knuckles, since you lose the Chaos Emeralds at the Master Emerald Shrine in Mushroom Hill. You now have to find 7 more giant, hyper rings throughout the stages, same process though. Which then drops you back into the Shrine Room, where you get to pick in any order which Super Emerald or stage you want to go after. These Super Emerald stages are just new, more difficult versions of the previous stages, while adding in some more tricky sections. Once completing a stage, you get a Super Emerald now, which when all seven are collected, Sonic, Knuckles, and Tails, who missed out on a Super form with all the Chaos Emeralds, can now all go Hyper, or Super for Tails, giving the same abilities as the Super form, but this time are an epileptic's nightmare in that they flash all colors of the rainbow, stars twinkling around them, along with having a super cool after image, and each character gets a unique ability. For Sonic, he gets a mid-air dash that instant kills any nearby enemies. Knuckles, when gliding onto a wall, causes a small earthquake that destroys nearby enemies, and Tails' super form glows from yellow to orange, and instead of an earthquake or mid-air dash, he gets a couple of flickies that run around in wild and destroy everything in sight while Tails just chills there. Along with all the other abilities everyone gets, like invincibility and such, they're all a lot of fun to play with and feel very rewarding when getting the super and hyper forms, along with unlocking the true ending for each character. The music in these stages is also really good, bringing back that more catchy tune from Sonic 2 compared to the more dreamlike music from Sonic 1 and CD. Like every other Sonic game, there's a hidden 8th special stage which can be accessed from the level select screen and by playing any sound between 00 through 07 and pressing A plus start. Once completed, it awards a grey chaos emerald that obviously has no effect. I almost forgot. There are also bonus stages that can be accessed like Sonic 2's special stage. That being, if you have 20 plus rings, you either get access to the slot machine stage, which is basically the Sonic 1 special stages where you can win rings, lives, continues, and power-ups, along with a new stage where you need to outrun this laser beam behind you by launching yourself off these glow balls and bumpers to also achieve all the great stuff like extra lives and rings and such. They're a cool addition and can be useful when trying to get more rings to go super. The special stages are so fun to play, and while the stage itself is not my favorite special stage out of the classics, that being CD's stages, of course. The way to get there is awesome, and I would love to see it become the staple for the 2D games. The giant rings even encourage finding them after you have Hypersonic, because they'll give you 50 rings instead of access to a special stage, therefore giving you access to the Super or Hyper forms. Unfortunately though, the Super Emeralds and the Hyper forms are non-canon for some reason, but still remain a fan favorite, even appearing in the Archie comics in issue 71. Oh, the music. Arguably some of the best in the franchise, but also why Sonic 3 is such a cursed game and you haven't seen any re-releases since the early 2000s. The music was mainly composed by <gasps> Brad Buxer, Siraku Jones, Bobby Brooks, Gary Ross, Jeff Grace, Doug Grigsby III, Sakio Ogawa, Tatsuki Medea, Masanori Hikachi, Tomonori Sawada, Masaru Setsumaru, Yoshiaki Kashima, Masasuki Naedo, Miyoko Takarua, Jun Sanu from Crush 40, but working as a sound effect designer in the role, 
Sonic 3 being his first project with the team, and finally, top this list off, Michael Jackson. Sega hired pop sensation Michael Jackson to compose the music for the game, but his work was scrapped. However, the music has some similarities to Jackson's work, as the chiptunes in Sonic the Hedgehog 3 were based on music sheets from Jackson. His album, Dangerous, was released a few years before Sonic 3 and would be the basis for the chiptunes on Sonic 3. Brad Buxer confirmed that some of Michael Jackson's work is in the game. Buxer spoke about which tracks he worked on, those being Marble Garden, which sounds very familiar to Will You Be There, Carnival Night Zone, sounding similar and taking a sample from Jam, Ice Cap, which sounds like a sped up version of Who Is It, along with using an instrumental version of an unreleased song from the Jetsons called Hard Times, and the ending credits, which sounds very similar to Stranger in Moscow. Once all of Jackson's official work was pulled, Sega's staff composer Howard Drozen ended up finishing the soundtrack and was the sole composer of the Sonic and Knuckles soundtrack, so great job to him. Jackson apparently pulled his name from the game since he was unhappy with the sound capabilities the Genesis had, according to Buxton from a 2009 interview with French magazine Black and White. Naoto Oshima, Sonic CD's lead developer and the designer of Sonic, even said Jackson recorded an acapella demo tape for the game that he believes Sega still has. But in 2010, Sega of America president Tom Kalinowski, Sonic 3's marketing director Pam Kelly, and Sega staff senior producer Mike Latham stated that Jackson had no involvement in the game with their knowledge. Which sounds like bullshit and they wanted to cut any ties with Jackson, especially since this was the year after he passed away in 2009 and all the child diddling accusations came to light. Also around the time, Sonic 3 got its last current re-release, which is theorized to be a mix of the Jackson diddling claims and legal problems with the Jackson estate on their rights to the music. There's been other things said about it, like June Sununun in 2010 saying he knew about it but wasn't allowed to discuss. For the general public, we'll probably never see Sonic 3 again unless it's with new music. And for Jackson's involvement, it's probably always going to stay a mystery. Nonetheless, we still got one of the best video game soundtracks of all time. I'm gonna keep this short. Some people say that Sonic 3 and Knuckles is the only good Sonic game, and while I don't agree with that being the only good Sonic game, there is a reason why this game is so well revered and in my opinion, not only one of the greatest Sonic games in the franchise, really feeling like this was all hands on deck and a true love child from Sonic Team, but also the pinnacle of Sonic's gameplay by being able to blend all of the major pillars of Sonic into one excellent free flowing gameplay loop, a very compelling and interesting story that enriches the Sonic universe, characters that felt alive and distinct, some of the greatest video game music ever created, level design that is not only three times the size of any level before it, but is also packed to the brim with things to find and interact with, and the beautiful art and environment design Sonic is known for. All this not only being revolutionary for a platformer at this time, but also revolutionary for gaming, as this was all shoved into a relatively old Sega Genesis, and still being in the 16-bit era of gaming. On top of all of this, the game was still rushed. Producing one of the greatest video games of all time and making Sonic's already big impact in the gaming industry now a lasting imprint that to this day is still there. Sonic 3 and Knuckles is 100% worthy of the S tier. S plus even though that's not a real thing. Sonic 3's only real misstep in my opinion was Marble Garden, while Sonic and Knuckles is a straight through 10 out of 10 in every zone for me. 3K not only breaks the 3 curse in the gaming industry of the third game in the franchise not really living up to the previous installments, but makes Sonic 1, 2, and CD look all up to 3K. All with a very engaging story, remember that DBZ comparison I was making? The story of 3K feels very very much like the Demon King slash Piccolo Jr. arc of Dragon Ball, how although tying up Dragon Ball in a satisfying conclusion and being very grounded in its universe, it leaves the door open for the next adventure when everything goes balls to the walls crazy in scope and setting. What I'm getting at here is the transition of Dragon Ball to Dragon Ball Z is very similar to the Genesis games transition, especially Sonic 3K to Sonic Adventure onward, in that both sequels DBZ and SA1 take the groundwork and redefine what their respective franchises represent while still feeling grounded in their own universes, like closing an old and opening a new arc to a shonen. And it's funny that Sonic 3 and Knuckles feels like the excellent send-off for this arc. My feelings on 3K's excellence were very similar to what reviewers said at the time of release for Sonic 3 in that it was very, very, very well received, getting an 89% on game rankings and a 94% by CVG, all mainly citing it as the best in the franchise, but too short due to the Sonic & Knuckles add-on not being there originally. But, with the release of Sonic & Knuckles, this became THE definitive Sonic game at the time, with Electronic Games Monthly giving it a 9.5 out of 10, and GamePro giving it a perfect score of 10 out of 10. 
Well, this wraps up the classic Sonic era, and while I do plan on eventually going back and doing the not-so-well-known games like Knuckles Chaotix or 3D Blast, I do want to move forward in the franchise with a game I hold very, very dear to my heart, Sonic Adventure. Sonic 3 & Knuckles is not only one of the best games ever made, but is also the perfect ending to the Genesis era, and it blows my mind how muddled and roadblocked the development was for this game, and Sonic Team still delivered tenfold. It was incredibly interesting reading and researching about the development of this game and all the games in the past, it made me appreciate it even more so. I may switch the style of these videos up as I don't want to keep you guys here for an hour and a half, so let me know what you think. Thanks for watching and let me know what I can improve on, and if you enjoyed this video, feel free to subscribe and rate the video. See you next time! Hey guys, Elderin here. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching this video, and uh, just wanted to kind of go off script and just say uh, thank you, since we're kind of wrapping up the 2D classic games and moving over to the 3D games now, but I will be covering a lot of the more uh, nuanced or um, obscure 2D Sonic games uh, as we get further on into the uh, franchise. But yeah, I just want to say thank you. Um, I've been having a blast making these, and I hope you guys are having as much fun watching them as I am making them. So uh, as this is a franchise I hold pretty dear to my heart, so um, funny enough. But uh, yeah, and I just I love being able to discuss this with the comments and you guys. Just, you know, see everyone's opinions on games, even if they don't agree with mine. Um, so yeah, if you guys uh, have any suggestions or anything, feel free to comment them. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the Sonic Adventure video.